The first sign of gold is rarely a rock. It is life behaving differently. Long before a prospector pans a stream or a drill touches bedrock, the land has already responded to what lies beneath it. Not loudly, not visibly, but biologically. There are places where vegetation grows when it shouldn't, where certain plants appear isolated, clustered, or strangely dominant against otherwise ordinary terrain. To most people, this looks like coincidence. To geology, it is reaction. Gold does not sit inert beneath the surface. It exists within a chemical environment shaped by pressure, heat, and fluid movement. And that environment does not end abruptly at the rock boundary. Over time, it leaks upward, altering soil chemistry in subtle but measurable ways. Roots are the first to notice. Plants live where chemistry allows them to survive. Their roots absorb more than water. They take in trace metals, ions, and dissolved elements released by weathering rock below. In mineralized ground, those elements are not balanced the way they are elsewhere. Arsenic appears where it normally wouldn't. Iron concentrations fluctuate. Sulfur compounds linger longer in the soil profile. Most plants struggle in these conditions. A few adapt. An even smaller number thrive. These plants are not attracted to gold itself. Gold is chemically inert at the surface. What they respond to are the companions of gold. The elemental signatures left behind by the geological processes that carried it upward. Gold rarely travels alone. It moves with quartz-forming fluids, iron-rich solutions, and sulfur-bearing compounds. When those fluids cool and solidify underground, they leave behind a chemical halo. That halo extends upward through fractures, pores, and microchannels in the rock. Over thousands of years, rainwater interacts with that halo. Oxygen oxidizes exposed minerals. Microorganisms accelerate breakdown. Slowly, the chemical fingerprint of a deep gold system migrates toward the surface. The surface responds. Soils change color. Drainage improves or worsens. Nutrient availability shifts. What grows there changes too. In some regions, plants with unusually deep root systems dominate mineralized zones. They push downward not for gold, but for moisture locked in fractured rock. Fractures created by the same tectonic forces that allow gold-bearing fluids to rise in the first place. In other areas, plants tolerant of heavy metals gain an advantage. Their biochemistry allows them to neutralize toxic ions that would kill competitors. Over generations, those species become markers not because they seek gold, but because gold reshaped the land they inhabit. This is not folklore. It is documented science. Geologists call it geobotanical expression. Exploration teams quietly use it to narrow search zones long before expensive surveys begin. Satellite imagery identifies vegetation anomalies. Ground teams confirm soil chemistry. Drilling follows last. The public sees plants, the industry sees data. In parts of Nevada, Arizona, and California, gold-bearing terrains show distinct vegetative patterns when viewed from above. Slight differences in color, density shifts that don't match rainfall, growth lines that follow buried faults rather than topography. These are not accidents. They are biological reactions to geological memory. Gold formation requires violence, intense heat, crushing pressure, fracturing rock. That violence does not heal cleanly. It leaves scars in the crust, faults, shear zones, altered rock bodies. Those scars influence how water moves, how nutrients accumulate, how roots spread. Plants follow those pathways because life always follows least resistance. Gold followed them first. In certain cases, plants have been shown to absorb microscopic gold particles themselves. 
not in quantities that matter economically, but enough to prove contact. Tiny grains carried upward in solution, taken into roots, transported into stems and leaves. The gold is not visible, but it is measurable. More important than the gold itself is what it confirms, an active pathway from depth to surface. Where that pathway exists, gold once moved, and where gold moved, some of it stayed. The mistake most people make is assuming surface calm means subsurface emptiness. In reality, the opposite is often true. The richest systems are quiet on the surface because they formed deep and remained intact. Plants do not grow randomly over those systems. They grow selectively, a single species appearing repeatedly across distant locations is not coincidence if those locations share the same subsurface structure. The plant is responding to a consistent chemical and physical environment created by the same geological process. To the untrained eye, it looks like vegetation preference. To geology, it is a map. This is why experienced observers never dismiss plant anomalies. They ask different questions. Why does this species grow here but not 20 meters away? Why does it align with this ridge instead of the valley? Why does it persist in poor soil where others fail? The answers are rarely botanical. They are geological. Gold does not create plants. But the conditions that create gold also create environments where certain plants dominate. The relationship is indirect subtle, and incredibly reliable when understood properly. This is why early prospectors, long before modern science, often trusted the land itself. They followed patterns they could not explain. They noticed where vegetation changed abruptly, where growth seemed out of place. They were not following superstition. They were following evidence without vocabulary. Modern geology gave that evidence a language. And once you learn that language, the surface of the earth stops looking neutral. It becomes expressive. Gold leaves traces, not of shine, but of imbalance. Not of color, but of survival. Plants are simply the most patient witnesses. They stand where chemistry allows them to stand. They grow where history shaped the ground beneath them. They remain long after the violence that created gold has ended, and they continue to signal it silently to anyone who knows how to read them. How animals accidentally reveal gold deposits. Animals do not understand geology, but they live inside its consequences. Every movement an animal makes across the land is shaped by the physical properties of the ground beneath it. Temperature, firmness, drainage, mineral content. These factors quietly influence where animals walk, dig, rest, and return again and again. Gold changes all of them, not directly, but inevitably. When gold-bearing systems form, they fracture rock, alter mineral composition, and change how water moves underground. Those changes do not disappear when the gold solidifies. They remain embedded in the landscape, influencing the surface for thousands of years. Animals respond to that influence without knowing why. Burrowing animals prefer ground that is stable but workable. They avoid loose sand and solid bedrock, choosing instead fractured zones where soil holds shape without collapsing. Those fractured zones are often fault lines, the same structures that once carried mineral-rich fluids upward. Rodents tunnel where rock is broken. Gold follows broken rock. Hoofed animals choose paths that drain well and resist erosion. Iron-rich and silica-altered ground compacts differently under pressure, forming natural trails that persist long after the animals themselves are gone. These trails frequently trace mineralized zones because those zones weather differently than surrounding rock. Animals follow efficiency. 
Gold followed physics. Birds gather pebbles for digestion, instinctively selecting stones of certain density and hardness. In placer environments, this behavior concentrates heavy minerals in nesting areas, subtly exposing materials that would otherwise remain buried. They are not revealing gold intentionally, they are revealing sorting. Large mammals return repeatedly to wallows and water sources where minerals leach into groundwater. These sites often sit above altered bedrock, where fractures allow fluids to rise. Over time, repeated trampling exposes deeper layers, sometimes bringing quartz fragments or oxidized rock to the surface. The ground looks disturbed, but it is not random disturbance. It is repetition, and repetition is information. Human prospectors often mistake animal signs as background noise. Burrows are filled, trails ignored, exposed stones dismissed as coincidence. But nature rarely repeats itself without reason. Animals return to the same places because those places offer physical advantages created by subsurface structure. And subsurface structure is exactly what controls where gold accumulates. This is why some of the richest discoveries in history occurred near places that had been worked unknowingly by animals for generations. Not because animals found gold, but because they exposed the conditions that allowed it to exist. Gold does not care about surface beauty. It responds to stress, pressure, and chemical imbalance. Animals respond to those same imbalances from the opposite direction. One moves downward through earth, the other moves across it, where their paths intersect, clues surface. This is the untold truth. Gold leaves behavioral footprints, not in maps, not in legends, but in repeated patterns of movement that only make sense when viewed through geology. Once you recognize this, the land becomes readable in a new way. Trails stop being trails, burrows stop being holes. Disturbed ground stops being accidental. They become expressions of physics written in behavior. And here is the deeper insight most people miss. Nature does not hide gold. It simply does not explain it. The signs are always present in plants adapting to hostile chemistry, in animals favoring altered ground, in landscapes shaped by forces far older than human memory. Those who fail to find gold search for shine. Those who succeed learn to observe reaction. Gold is not revealed by tools alone. It is revealed by understanding how earth, life, and time interact. And once you see that relationship clearly, you realize something powerful. The land has been pointing to its own wealth long before anyone thought to ask. It never stopped. We simply forgot how to listen.